have spent over a decade reviewing Magic the Gathering products and accessories, and in that time, I have seen some excellent things. I was there reviewing the very first Commander Precons, and have seen amazing one-hit wonders from the Commander's Arsenal to Ravnica Guild Kits, and so much more. Magic the Gathering has been filled with amazing and innovative supplemental products that have, time and time again, been absolutely worth it to buy. Yep, and there's also been an awful lot of slurry. You know what I mean when I describe a Magic the Gathering product as slurry, don't you? I mean, it's junk, nonsense, garbage, a not very good deal, refuse, crapola, lacking in quality, drivel, twaddle, Baloney. And having methodically reviewed so many, many instances of Magic the Gathering baloney over the years, I thought I'd take a painful and mind-numbing trip down memory lane and present to you the top five worst Magic the Gathering product failures of all time. Now, my criteria here is not to talk about regular Magic the Gathering sets, so I'm not at any point going to say, oh, a uh, Homelands, or Dragon's Maze, or Murders at Karlov Manor. We are talking instead about products made in addition to the standard Magic the Gathering draft sets. So in other words, everything from pre-constructed decks, supplemental sets, other products like that. That is what this is an examination of. So which of those are the greatest failures in Magic the Gathering history? Let's take a look. But first, wouldn't it be cool if video games could teach you real life skills? Like maybe you play Super Mario Brothers and you learn plumbing, or you play Tetris and you're trained in architecture, or maybe you play The Legend of Zelda and it'll teach you how to wield a master sword in order to conquer the evil Ganon after he plunges the land into eternal conflict and... Uh, <clears throat> Sorry, got a little carried away there, but actually, that idea is exactly what today's sponsor is all about. You see, Boot.dev was designed with one simple goal, teach you how to code by using a captivating online RPG, one that you can consume at your own pace. Instead of memorizing a list of spells or what components you need to make a certain potion, this RPG will teach back-end web development from start to finish in the Python and Go programming languages. The platform is designed to get you writing a ton of code because getting your hands on the keyboard and shipping projects is the only way to really learn. I sat down to give the trial a whirl and ended up getting halfway through the first course of learning Python without even noticing. The best part? The creators of Boot.dev believe coding shouldn't be locked behind a paywall, so all of their content is free to read and watch in guest mode. A paid membership just unlocks interactivity and the game that goes with it. So finally, a game without a battle pass or microtransactions. In fact, Boot.dev is training you to actually make money. According to Stack Overflow, the median salary for backend developers in the United States in 2023 was over $100,000. Not to mention most programmers often have the option to work remotely or from home, which seems a lot better than the few rupees you get for saving all of Hyrule. So start your steps down the career path in computer sciences today, all while playing a fun RPG. Click the link in this video's description box and use code TELARIAN to get 25% off of your first payment for Boot.dev. That's 25% your first month or your first year, depending on the subscription you choose. Thank you, Boot.dev, for sponsoring this video. Now, it goes without saying that the single worst Magic the Gathering product ever made is Magic 30th Anniversary Edition. So we are just going to get that one out of the way right now and say that this list is the top five worst Magic products other than Magic 30th Anniversary Edition. Because there's just no topping this. Wizards of the Coast, in order to celebrate 30 years of Magic the Gathering, decided the best thing to do would be to sell four booster packs of real fake Magic the Gathering cards for $1,000. The product was considered to be an absolute slap in the face to Magic players. Four booster packs of proxies for $1,000 means you're spending that $1,000 on four random 
fake rares. Sure, you might get a real fake dual land that you are not allowed to play with in your legacy deck because, well, it, because it's a fake card, but that $1,000 might just mean that you crack open a fake animate wall in the rare slot. Four random rares that are not tournament legal for $1,000 and technically not commander legal either for $1,000? Wildly, had they not gone full greed, this could have potentially been a very successful product if they sold the packs at prices that the majority of players could afford. Oh, and had it also been sold at local game stores instead of only directly through Wizards of the Coast's online sales. <laughs> what a great way to celebrate 30 years of Magic the Gathering by cutting out all local game stores from the product so that 100% of profits went to Wizards of the Coast. Cards Magic players can't play with and a product game stores aren't given the option to carry and sell. What a great way to celebrate 30 years of Magic. Amazingly, when the 30th edition did go on sale, Wizards of the Coast ended it after only one hour. Now you may think that meant that it sold out after only one hour, but their wording, the 30th anniversary edition sale has concluded Included, and the product is currently unavailable for purchase, thanks to everyone who joined us today, seemed to imply it most certainly did not sell out and, as many have theorized, may have been selling so poorly that Wizards wanted to just end the fiasco and try and maintain value on their precious, precious thousand dollar per pack real fake magic cards. All right, so with Magic 30 out of the way and hopefully never, ever, ever to be thought about again, what are the top five biggest failures of Magic products? Well, I said in my intro that we won't be looking at standard draft sets, but what about a product, and I am gonna use that term loosely, that took two existing standard draft sets and just kinda copy-pasted or mashed them together into one unnecessary, unwanted, and overall uninteresting product? Well, that is our number five worst product ever made that's not Magic 30 edition, and that product is Innistrad, double feature, a double or perhaps triple disappointment. Innistrad double feature can be summed up as the worst, most uninspired remastered set ever. Described by Wizards of the Coast as a quote unquote curated draft experience, double feature literally just took the two most recent Innistrad sets, Midnight Hunt and Crimson Vow and combine them into one singular set with zero curation or card selection whatsoever. To top it all off, the artwork was all reprinted in grayscale, making the cards dull, hard to read, and even harder to distinguish from one another, and an even worse play experience. And that play experience was not helped by the fact that, again, no curation was done. Double feature was every single card from both sets, including duplicates, yes, even including duplicates, mashed together into one booster pack. And it wasn't even a booster pack of Crimson Vow and a booster pack of Midnight Hunt combined into some kind of mega pack, but rather this was still just a 15 card draft pack with half its contents from Midnight Hunt, the other half from Crimson Vow, 15 cards pulled from two sets that were not even designed to be drafted together. What were they charging for this travesty, do you think? That's right, $9.99 per pack. That's Modern Masters pricing, people. It was was literally more expensive than buying one pack of Midnight Hunt and one pack of Crimson Vow. And it was literally one pack of Midnight Hunt and one pack of Crimson Vow combined, except it was only 15 cards instead of the 30 you'd have gotten with two packs. So yeah, this was quite the failure of a product. The only reason this product is at the bottom of our list is that unlike literally every product I'm about to mention, you could at least have a game of Magic the Gathering with double feature. Sure, it would be a terrible game, a sloppy, unplanned, uncoordinated draft, and all the cards all blend into one another and generally look terrible, but there's still a game there, I guess, and a few of those cards are worth something. Yeah. So what could possibly be worse than double feature? A, a lot, actually. 
Coming in as the fourth worst product Magic the Gathering has ever made that isn't Magic 30th Edition, it's Theme Boosters. Theme Boosters were 35 card boosters whose contents were linked by a theme, which 99% of the time was just a color, such as blue. That's the theme for this theme booster, the color blue. Sometimes the themes would be more interesting, such as vampires or lore hold, but the majority of the time the theme was no more complex or interesting than just a pack of all white cards from the current set. There were a lot of problems with theme boosters, least of all their price being $6.99, making them more expensive than a booster pack. Despite this, and despite having 35 cards, theme boosters only had one rare or mythic, and the rest of the contents were commons and uncommons, mostly commons. Why were these things $6.99 again? So they cost nearly double that of a regular booster pack, except they still only had one rare in them. The themes were almost always limited to just being cards of the same color. They didn't even have lands in them, so you couldn't crack them open and play them against one another without adding basics of your own. Not the best setup for a product aimed at new and casual players. Now, starting with Throne of Eldraine, Wizards tried to up player interest by saying one in every 10 theme boosters would have a second rare, but this in no way fixed theme boosters' problems. You couldn't play with them, they were a bad value, and the themes were uninteresting or, quite frankly, absent altogether. So Wizards of the Coast tried again to course correct and rebranded theme boosters as jumpstart set packs, improving the design of theme boosters a little, but damaging the quality of the already popular jumpstart packs dramatically. These jumpstart set packs were nothing like the beloved jumpstart product we'd had before. They were actually just glorified theme packs, where for most sets there was just one theme per color for the jumpstart set packs. So you're still just getting green as a theme or red. They had new rares that were designed for them and terrible to play with and repeated throughout your jumpstart box. It made for a boring, uninteresting jumpstart experience and really just seemed to be an attempt by Wizards of the Coast to rebrand theme boosters with the name of a much more popular product while not changing much about them. In the end, the Jumpstart redesign lasted for only a few sets, as, just like theme boosters, most local game stores could not sell them, and worse, these new crappy Jumpstart boosters were damaging the golden reputation of Jumpstart proper. Which again, proper Jumpstart was one of the best products Wizards of the Coast has ever made. If theme boosters were a disappointing failure, then the Jumpstart set boosters were a damaging one, and both stopped being made without so much as an announcement from Wizards of the Coast. But as bad as theme and jumpstart set boosters were, they could not compare to the next biggest failure of Magic the Gathering products, a product that tried to sell you things such as a cut, uncut sheet, and an exclusive, non-exclusive art print. That's right, do you even remember the deluxe edition, or have you forgotten this stink burger entirely? The Deluxe Edition is quite possibly one of the worst Magic the Gathering products ever made, and that is extremely depressing, not just because it was such an outright disaster of a product, but also the fact that this is only number three on my list. For those of you who either were not around for the Deluxe Edition, or perhaps have just blocked the trauma from your minds, let's play a game. How much do you think this product should have cost? It contained 16 Throne of Eldraine collector boosters, an Ultra Pro card binder, one one foil Garrick Cursed Huntsman Borderless Planeswalker card, one art print of the Borderless Garrick Cursed Huntsman, one non-foil version of the Biobox promo, Kenrith the Returned King, a 3x3 three three piece or card strip cut from a foil uncut sheet of Throne of Eldraine, and an arena code for Garrick sleeves on arena and some card styles. So basically, the meat here is a booster box and a half of collector boosters, but in addition to those, what are you getting? An Ultra Pro binder, a Magic Arena sleeve, a cut piece of an uncut sheet? And I'll repeat that. They took uncut sheets of Throne of Eldraine and cut them up and sold it to you. Cool! There was also a non-foil version of the Buy a Box promo and that art print of Garrick that turned out to not be exclusive. The artist was still able to sell prints of it, bigger, better prints of it. So what would you pay for the Deluxe Edition? Knowing all of that, say your price, post your price. What do you think that price is? 
$449. They wanted nearly $500 for this thing. I did an entire video about what an absolute failure of a product the Deluxe Edition was, so I have to resist the urge to spend the next 20 minutes tearing this apart. But I'll say this, even as a product made for those with money to burn, the Deluxe Edition was a ripoff. When I look at things like the Deluxe Edition, I just want to say, hey, save the whales. Save them from that. So, what are the two biggest product failures in Magic the Gathering? Well, it certainly is not the product that I had a hand in designing, the Academic Deck Box, available now at local game stores near you. The Academic is at your local game store right now, today, manufactured by Gamegenic, who I spent over a year working with to design the deck box of my dreams, the Academic finally has come to retail. So if you are interested in your own academic, head on down to your local game store or just pick one up wherever Gamegenic products are sold. I mean, there's worse deck boxes than the academic out there, by far. And as far as Magic the Gathering products go, there's still two huge failures, not counting, of course, Magic 30, the biggest failure ever. But anyway, what is number two? A long time ago, Wizards of the Coast decided it wanted me, the professor, to reveal a product to the Magic the Gathering community. This would be a product exclusively previewed on Talarian Community College. Bigger than just a preview card, this was an entire product for the product review channel to unveil. It was audacious. It was bold. It was the second worst product ever made. Secret Layer Ultimate Edition was, from the very start, a disaster. At a time when the Zendikar Fetchlands had only seen one reprint in the premium-priced Modern Masters 2017 set and had notably been omitted from our first return to Zendikar, Wizards of the Coast decided to flat-out sell you one of each of the five Fetchlands in a secret lair. The price? Well, they couldn't say the price. But what they were able to say was... Yeah, so we don't do MSRP anymore. Right. Um, but we expect this to sell for a bit more than uh, Commander Anthology. Unfortunately, Wizards of the Coast only sent three to four copies of this product to each store, and not even all stores. Some got one copy, some got none. And that price turned out to be, at time, $275 to as high as $400 at some stores. Even going off of the low price of $275, that meant each fetch land was costing you $55. And again, that was the lowest it was available at in most stores. And it really was a shame because, if nothing else, the artwork on these fetch lands is gorgeous. Each depicts its respective fetch land on a different plane in the Magic the Gathering multiverse, with stunning artwork from talented artists like John Avon to Elena Danner. Seriously, a Lorwyn Marsh Flats by one of the most talented Magic the Gathering artists working today? Simply sublime. But not worth $55, especially when, at the time, even without the reprints in the yet unreleased Modern Horizons 2, a Marsh Flats wasn't even selling for $55. So why would you spend $55 each on these fetch lands when it's cheaper to, I, I don't know. And what's more, these five cards came five cards in this enormous box. It was huge, which just made everyone wonder how much less expensive this could have been or how many more of them they could have made and sent to stores if only the packaging wasn't this giant do-nothing box. And no, the box didn't even hold magic cards. It wasn't designed with rows or, or even the right dimensions to hold magic cards. It was apparently conceived of as only for showing off your five fetch lands. This is a pretty personal product for me. It was the only time Wizards of the Coast ever wanted to work with me in any capacity beyond just my making a video previewing new cards. And well, what else could I do with this? I told people it wasn't worth it. Amazingly, Wizards of the Coast took this disaster and tried to outdo themselves by releasing Secret Layer Ultimate Edition 2. Ultimate Edition 2 had twice as many cards in it. 10, but they weren't fetch lands or even shock lands. They were the 10 pathway lands, which are cards that at the time were worth much, much less. Again, nothing against the artwork, but the giant oversized box, the high price tag, it all reeked of Wizards of the Coast just trying to see if they could sell cards to consumers at or around the values said cards held on the secondary market. Uh, no, they didn't ask me to in any way be involved in Secret Layer Ultimate Edition 2. I, I get it. 
that's understandable. But you know, it is too bad because deep inside of Secret Lair Ultimate Edition is a good idea. Offer needed reprints featuring stunning new artwork at what should be an affordable price and sell it through local game stores. The problem, as I suspect, is that they didn't want to sell it at a reasonable price. They wanted to sell it at a price closer to what these cards were going for individually on the secondary market. So they added the giant box to help justify the price, but in the end, it just ended up being one of the worst products ever made. And they said, where should we reveal this product? Why on Tolarian Community College? And then they never called me again. But it was not, he says coyly, the worst product ever made. That honor goes to a product so bad, it derailed an entire product line. A product that did so poorly that even Mark Rosewater, the most cheerful of cheerleaders in all of Magic the Gathering, could only describe it as hated. That product, of course, was Aftermath Epilogue Boosters, a product that may have been a train wreck, but may also be coming back. Coming back? Oh no! Aftermath Epilogue Booster Packs contain five cards each and cost, at the time of release, $3.50 each. I will repeat that, because it bears repetition. Epilogue Booster Packs contained five cards and cost, at the time of their release, $3.50 each. One to three of those cards would be rare or higher, and the remaining two to four would be uncommons. Within those five cards, one to two of them will be foil. There's not much more to even say about this product because there's just so little to Epilogue Boosters. The set itself only had 50 cards, which even at only five cards per booster pack meant pack after pack after pack. It was just pure repeats. I'd open up so many packs that had two or even three of the exact same card. And whether it was a card designated as a rare or not, when you are opening two to three copies of it in a single booster pack, then no, it's not rare. And it's not going to hold much, if any, joy or value. Or fun! There's a certain misery in opening up a booster box of Aftermath and just seeing the same card again and again and again. And then you get to pack number two. <laughs> My booster box games for Aftermath were probably some of the lowest viewed in the entire series, a series I've been doing for a decade, and this was the one that no one wanted to watch, because who wants to sit and watch that? There were also collector booster packs of Aftermath, which were $200 per box of 12 packs, and each of those packs had, wait for it, six, six cards in them. Wow, six cards for a $20 pack. Sign me up, or don't, because that is just awful. It goes without saying that unlike Double Feature, you could not even draft or play sealed with Aftermath packs. The cards were, with a very few rare exceptions, largely lukewarm power-wise, and not something that found much of a home anywhere, including Commander. They did not even serve their one purported purpose of being a way to offer an interesting and detailed epilogue to the epic magic story storyline that concluded in March of the Machine. There was little story even discussed, let alone epilogued in these cards. Most didn't even have flavor text. And what's wild about epilogue boosters is that Wizards of the Coast was so certain of their success that they planned them as a new recurring product. Outlaws of Thunder Junction even had an entire mini epilogue booster set designed, but when Aftermath failed as hard as it did, they literally took this entire set that they were going to sell in more five-card boosters and just you know, dumped it, crammed it into the main set. But unfortunately, this kind of slapdash save couldn't be done for the upcoming Assassin's Creed set, which will feature the unceremonious return of Epilogue Boosters, or rather, as they have been rebranded, Beyond Boosters. Beyond Boosters will contain eight cards as opposed to only five to six. Wow, two additional cards. And the Assassin's Creed mini set has a total of 100 cards in it instead of 50, so that'll hopefully help. But call it whatever you want. This is very clearly a set that was meant to be Epilogue Boosters and then got changed last minute with a rebrand and not much else. It amazes me how much faith and certainty they had in five five-card booster packs, 
that were intended to be sold for just under $4 each. Amazes me that they'd be so certain of their genius that they'd plan these as a new booster pack fixture of sets to come, so much so that they'd even consider it the perfect means of delivery for a coveted Universes Beyond product line. Now, to be fair, we don't know what is in the Assassin's Creed set yet, other than Leonardo da Vinci in Italian only. And it is perfectly possible that since they had enough warning that they were able to course correct and these Beyond boosters will be, I don't know, I don't want to say amazing because I just can't see that happening, but maybe, just maybe, they might not flat out suck. Good card designs will certainly help with that. A good price tag would help even more. Opening packs that don't have three copies of the same uninteresting card would especially help. Aftermath was also the set that Wizards of the Coast was so protective of that they hired literally the Pinkertons to go intimidate a Magic the Gathering YouTuber who opened a box of it early. Can you imagine sending hired goons to a YouTuber's house over Aftermath? But I don't want to just focus on the biggest failures of Magic's history. Let's talk about some of their biggest successes. What products do you think are Magic the Gathering's best? Not actual draft sets, but supplemental products and sets that they've released over the years. Let me know in the comments below. And speaking of over the years, Tolarian Community College is almost at 1 million subscribers. I was the first Magic the Gathering YouTube channel to hit 100,000, and it looks like I'll be the first to a million, but I need your help to get there. So if you're not already subscribed, subscribe. If you haven't already rang the bell, ring the bell. If you haven't hit like, hit like. Go back, watch another video. Watch, watch the new Shuffle Up and Play with Krim and Chase and Princess. It was an awesome episode. And if you missed it, you're missing out. So watch that video here. Thanks again to Boot.dev for sponsoring this video. And remember, a career in computer sciences is just an RPG away. Click the link in the description box and use code Tolarian to get 25% off your first payment for Boot.dev. That's 25% off your first month or your first year, depending on the subscription you choose. Thanks, Boot.dev. Pairs up the stairs, crumpets and tea, next time on Shovel Up and Play. Today, we are doing an educational game of Commander. We are going to teach you what a level 8 Commander deck is. Hi, I'm Lewis Stardust. Today, I'm playing Miram, Sentinel Worm. What's going on, y'all? It's your boy, Joe Johnson. And today, I am playing Preston Garvey, a new Fallout Commander. I'm Vince, also as Peasant Kenobi on the internet, the milkiest man in esports entertainment. And today, I'm playing Mono White out to Adrian. And since we are playing level eight decks, I'm on slivers. If I brought up all your slivers, would it upset you? Do you not see what is on Lua's board? Who has no blood? lands? Who has no lands? Oh no, but what's that instead of the land? Are you gonna be sad if your sliver dies? Like Yeah, I'm gonna be sad if my sliver dies. I'm still gonna do it. <laughs> yeah. A no. hole is an absence of donut. No, <laughs> not a <laughs> ring donut. <laughs> a whole donut doesn't have a hole. How did the jam get in? It puts they didn't teleport it in, bro. 